Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everyone. Welcome to day four of the five day Quranic Arabic course. Um, Insha'Allah, in this in this day, we are going to be diving deep and digging, digging deep to extract the gold from Arabic grammar. And I'll explain to you this metaphor very soon. As you all know, my name is Ustada Tasneem, aka Ukhti, your internet sister, and I'm the founder of Guthrie Arabic Academy, an online Arabic academy dedicated towards teaching the Muslims around the world the beauty of the Quran the beauty of Islam and the beauty of the Arabic language. Uh, I'm super passionate about this mission that I have of teaching uh, the Ummah Quranic Arabic especially because I know that when you learn Quranic Arabic and you understand the Quran, you'll get closer to Allah and that will make you treat people better and make the world a better place. So we're doing life-changing things here at Good Tree Arabic Academy and I hope that you can be part of it. Well, what are we going to be learning in this class in day four? Well, in the very first topic we're going to be talking about is the importance of learning Arabic grammar. In fact, it can be life or death. And I'm going to show you a funny example uh, of this as well. Number two, the miraculous, eloquent nature of Arabic language. And number three, how to learn Arabic grammar in an easy and fun way. And, of course, we will learn all the way to 30% of Quranic words because in the past couple of days we have been learning quite a few Quranic words in order to boost our percentage and uh, learn the most frequent words in the Quran. Go ahead and type in the chat box who wants to learn all the way to 30% of Quranic words so that you can understand the Quran, inshallah, without a translation. Well, how are you going to make the best of this class, especially for this day? Well, number one is to take notes because we will be writing down quite a few new facts. Number two is to participate and answer the questions and encourage others. And number three is to share the class. If you're on Facebook, you can share it on your timeline. And if you're on Instagram, I would really, really appreciate it if you could uh, maybe take a video or a picture and post it or even just send it to me. I would love to repost it and give you a shout out as well, inshallah. As you all know, we have a special Quran giveaway happening in this course. And I will be gifting three students from around the world this beautiful Maqdis Quran, which has the word by word translation. The winners will be announced at the end of the five days, so the end of tomorrow. There is one day left, so you have today to enter into this giveaway. And how will you enter this giveaway? Well, number one is to watch the recordings or attend all the days. Alhamdulillah, we're already on day four. Number two is to participate and share it on social media if you have so. Even if you tell one person in your WhatsApp group or in your family about this course, Alhamdulillah, I'm more than happy. But number three is the most important one, and that is to do the homework and to post it in the group uh, or to email me at gutriarabic at gmail.com. Uh, today's homework is very, very important. So please make sure that you stay until the very end so that I can explain to you how to do the homework for today. Okay, inshallah, go ahead and type okay in the chat box if you understand. Tayyib, inshallah, okay. Looking forward to it. Now let's get right into the content for today. Have you ever wondered what is the difference between a fatha, kasra, and dhamma? So in Arabic, we have these little marks on top of each letter. It's called a haraka, or in English, diacritic. And you know, even though this one little tiny little um, line, it looks like it's such a tiny little line, but actually it has so much meaning, okay? And it, actually, it can actually change the whole meaning of a sentence. And this is why we need to learn Arabic grammar. We need to understand why is it a dhamma, kasra, and fatha. We have to have a basic understanding of grammar to understand the meaning so that you can make your own correct Arabic sentences. And 
just a word of warning is that it's actually very dangerous to translate the Quran without solid grammar knowledge. So, you know, in English, we don't really learn that much grammar. You know, sometimes we do. But if you want to learn Arabic properly, you have to master the Arabic grammar. It's, in, in, it's an integral part of learning Arabic. Let me give you a very solid example, okay? So over here, we have uh, an ayah from the Qur'an. Um, you can write down your this word list over here, but I'm going to be explaining this ayah over here. So it goes, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Innama yakhsha allaha. Innama yakhsha allaha min. Oh, hey, everyone. We know what min means. Min ibadihi al-ulama. So innama means only. Yaksha means fear. Allah means Allah. Min, go ahead and type in the chat box. What does min mean? We all know what min means. That was the very first word that we learned, right? And min means from. Yes, very good. Excellent memory, everyone. min min his slaves, al-ulama, the scholars. Now, I'm gonna just um do this i want everybody to tell me in the chat box what is the haraka on the word allah over here is it a fatha dhamma or kasra innama yakhshallah ha okay good it's a fatha okay min and the second word that we're going to analyze over here is min ibadihi ulama u What's the haraka on this word, ulama'u? Yes, it is a dhamma. Now, when you keep the haraka, the, the marks or the diacritics, as we say, on the words like that, then the meaning is truly from his slaves. It is the scholars who fear Allah. Now, is that a correct meaning? Yeah, sure. It is a correct meaning because, yes, the scholars, they're the ones who should be fearing Allah. Truly from his slaves, it is the scholars who fear Allah, meaning because they have knowledge, they actually fear Allah on a different level, which is, the meaning is correct. Now, let's go and look, analyze the second ayah over here. If we, I mean, this, this second sentence over here, if we even change around the haraka and we make the fatha into a kasra and the uh, no, a fatha into a dhamma and a dhamma into a fatha we just swap it around and we say min then you know what happens everyone the whole meaning changes and it becomes like this it becomes truly from his slaves it is allah who fears the scholars is that a correct sentence does that have a correct meaning no absolutely not allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not fear anyone we, we should all be fearing him so you see you know every single haraka it has a grammatical purpose you know and even though listen look the the order of the words they didn't change yeah, the order of the words didn't change. The structure of the sentence didn't change. We didn't change any of the words. But just with a small, like, just, you know, swapping the dhamma into a fatha, fatha into a dhamma, the whole meaning has completely changed, right? Now, my dear brothers and sisters, when you're reciting the Qur'an as well, I really, really want to encourage you to read slowly, inshallah. You know, read with tadabbur read uh, calmly you know there's this um cultural sort of uh, tradition where you know there's this like competition of who reads the most quran during ramadan and that's fine you know if you're really good at reading then that's fine you can do that but we don't want to be reading the quran like a race car right we don't want to be reading the quran Oh, assalamu alaikum, Eva. How are you? <laughs> Mashallah. Eva, tell everybody about uh, my Arabic courses. Um, we don't want to be reading the Quran like Speedy Gonzales, right? We want to read with mindfulness. Yes, that's right, Aisha. Um, we want to be reading with devotion. We want to be 
really understanding and because we don't want to be changing the meaning right we don't want to be changing the meaning of the quran by reading fast you know we think oh we're going to get so much rewards by reading 10 pages but how many mistakes are you going to make in this 10 pages if you read without concentration right my dear sisters and my dear brothers it is better to read one page of the quran slowly with mindfulness with uh, actually absorbing something from it and gaining some knowledge rather than just reciting it um, on autoplay, <laughs> you know? Go ahead and type in the chat box if you agree with this mindset. Isn't it better to, like, yeah, the quality over quantity, right? And that is what we believe in in Islam, that quant quality is more better or quality is more valued than quantity because even Allah the Prophet Sallallahu said that the best of you are the ones who do good deeds even if they're small you know so Allah is pleased with the ones who does good deeds consistently even if they're small so that's the hadith right so may Allah make us of these people even if you do one thing but you do it really well and you do it consistently then Alhamdulillah, that can be literally your key to Jannah, inshallah. Okay, let me explain a little bit more about how important it is for us to learn Arabic grammar and for us to understand it. You know, in Surah Tawbah, by the way, does anyone know an interesting fact about Surah Tawbah? Who can, who can, um, so there's an interesting fact about Surah Tawbah. And that is that it is the only surah in the Quran that doesn't start without a, yes, that doesn't start without a bismillah. Yes, very good. Well done, everyone. I'm just seeing in the chat box, we have so many knowledgeable people in the chat box. I love that, mashallah. And um, this, there's actually a reason behind why that is so, but we don't have time to go into that today. Maybe you can do some research on why Surah Tawbah doesn't have a bismillah at the start of it. Anyway, Surah Tawbah, it goes straight into um, this topic and it goes, وَأَذَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ It is an announcement from Allah and His Messenger to the people on the day of the Greater Pilgrimage, أَنَّ اللَّهَ بَرِيءٌ مِّنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ وَرَسُولُهُ That Allah is disassociated from, his, from the disbelievers and so is His Messenger. Okay, so basically, what is this ayah saying? It's just saying that, you know, um, after the Prophet Sallallahu mission has been complete, you know, we have warned you. This is an announcement uh, on the Hajj al-Akbar, the day of the greater pilgrimage, that Allah is disassociated. What does that mean? Like he has nothing to do with the disbelievers and his messenger also doesn't have anything to do with the disbelievers. We've warned them many, many times and they didn't believe. So anything that happens to them, you know, it's it's their fault kind of thing, okay? So that is the meaning. Now, as you can see over here, there are actually a couple of recitations that are valid within this ayah. So you can actually say, وَرَسُولُهُ So go ahead and type in the chat box. What is the haraka on the word, on the, uh, on the word Rasul? The last word of this word is uh, the lamb. The who over here means his messenger, okay? So it is a dhamma, okay? It is a dhamma. Rasuluhu is a dhamma. And so the meaning in that case would actually be Allah is disassociated from the disbelievers and his messenger is also disassociated. That is the connotation behind this grammatical structure. And that actually makes sense. And that is what... um is mentioned in many recitations of the Quran and it's a correct recitation. There's another option that is also correct as well and that is when it goes lahu. What is the haraka on the lamb now everyone? It is a fatha. Now as you can see the word Allah it also has a fatha as well, right? So that means annallaha wa rasulahu like actually it's kind of like they're in the same category uh that they are both disassociated from the disbelievers you know so it's following the word allah and in that case it actually makes sense right it uh the meaning is correct 
However, what is the third option? The third option is when it's actually incorrect. Because when you say, Oh, what's the harakah on the lamb over here? It is a kasra. And so, Rasulihi, it actually means that it's following the word mushrikeen. It means that it's actually um, in the same category as the mushrikeen, the disbelievers. You're, you're, you're lumping Rasul and mushrikeen together because they're the same state. They're both majroor, as we say. So in that case, it means Allah is disassociated from disbelievers and his messenger. And is that a correct meaning? Yes or no? Go ahead and type in the chat box. Is it correct or incorrect? Will Allah ever be disassociated and will Allah ever leave his messenger? No, of course not. Of course not. You know, and it's incorrect. Astaghfirullah. May Allah protect us from making these mistakes. Because we don't want to be saying these things. And so you see, you know, um, what happened is that, uh, what's it called? Umar radiallahu anhu. Okay, we all know Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, right? He was the second khalifa of Islam. After the Prophet ﷺ passed away, the Islamic empire, it actually expanded way beyond the borders of Saudi Arabia, right? So that means a lot of non-Arabs were entering into Islam, right? Who here is a non-Arab? <laughs> I'm a non-Arab. I'm not actually Arab. I, I learned Arabic from the very beginning, you know? And so a lot of non-Arabs uh, were entering into Islam and they had to learn Arabic, of course, if they wanted to understand the Quran. And that's what they did. That's why so many Muslim countries, they have Arabic language and Arabic words in their language, you know, subhanAllah, because Arabic was such a permeant um an integral part of their life as a muslim um getting back to the story umar radiallahu anhu he was walking in um he was walking somewhere and he heard someone reciting this ayah and he heard them recite it like this Allah min al -mushrikeena wa rasulihi. he heard someone say rasulihi and he literally turned around and he went to that person and he and he took him by the shoulders and he said, what did you say? And then he said, oh, I don't I didn't know. I didn't know that it was incorrect. And then uh, he's and then after that, Omar, anhu, he made an announcement that every single person who learns the Quran must learn Arabic grammar, you know, so that was his like commandment back in the days when he was the Khalifa. And by the way, we have to remember that, of course, in those times, they didn't have uh, the book, you know, the Quran written down in one book. It was all passed down through memory. It was all passed down through maybe just uh, single pages. But it was mostly an oral, uh, you know, transmission. And so it was really important for them to learn Arabic grammar. But my dear sisters and brothers, why why are we leaving this um, very important tradition in the modern day century you know there's no reason for us to leave this because you see subhanallah you see um there is a very beautiful uh statement by sheikh al-islam ibn taymiyyah rahimahullah one of uh, the greatest scholars of islam and he and i want us to analyze what he said about arabic language okay and i want us to really reflect on this okay so what did he say he said it is known that Arabic is farud al-kifaya. Mm, okay, let me explain this concept to you a little bit. Does anyone know what is the difference? Oh, actually, let me explain it again. So in, in Islam, there are two types of farud. Farud in Arabic means obligation, okay? So there is farud kifaya, and then there is... Um, Actually, first of all, I'll tell you about the first fard is fard ain, and then the second fard or type of obligation is fard kifaya. Now, who can tell me what is the difference between the two? Can anyone tell me the difference between fard ain and fard kifaya? So, yes, yes. 
So fard ain actually means individual obligation. Okay. So it's something that you have to do yourself and no one can do it on your behalf. So go ahead and type in the chat box, what are some examples of fard ain, which is, um, yes, sure, mandatory on an individual. For example, yes, praying your five times salah, fasting in Ramadan. You have to give your own zakah. You have to read your own Quran. You have to... Uh, fulfill your obligations. Yes, Hajj, etc., etc. So there are many different types of fard ain. Okay, but there is another type of obligation, and that is a communal, communal obligation. So fard kifaya it actually means that in every community there needs to be some people doing that thing. Okay, can anyone give me an example of fard kifaya in a Muslim community? So yes, for example, Najla, you're saying uh, Eid Salah, someone has to know how to lead the Salah, right? They need to learn Quran and and maybe memorize the Quran and lead the prayer. Someone needs to learn how to do a janazah. Someone needs to learn how to uh, bury uh, the, the Muslim people's body and how to wash the body. You know, not everybody can do that, right? Not everybody has the skill or the mindset, um, even the stomach to even, even, even do those things. Yeah, but some people in the Muslim community, they, they need to learn so that they can serve the rest of the community. And similarly, my dear brothers and sisters, learning Arabic to the level of proficiency with the grammar, with the tafsir, you know, going on a path of seeking knowledge, it is fard kifaya. Why? Because, yes, maybe not every single person has the time or resources to learn Arabic grammar to a very high level. But however much you can, it is fard kifaya for you and you'll get the reward of the whole community. Especially in this day and age where Arabic language and Islamic knowledge is, it's so vastly available, but people teaching it is decreasing day by day. You know, so if you can be one of those people who even teaches their own children, you know, teaching your own children Arabic language is fard kifaya. And I would actually say it's fard ain in these days, you know, the way that we're going, subhanAllah. Go ahead and type in the chat box if you agree. And if you, inshallah, will have the intention of fulfilling this fard kifaya so that you can get the reward of your whole community, inshallah. Okay, well, let's continue on with the um, with the statement of Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. So he said that it is known that Arabic is fard kifaya. Okay, so it's not as... I'm not going to say it's not as important, but it's not as, um, what can I say? Like, it's on the second level, okay, of fard. So you would think that, okay, you know, you can slack off a bit, but no, they never slacked off even on the fard kifaya. The salaf, meaning the ancestors, our predecessors, the people before us would discipline their children for making grammatical mistakes. <laughs> They, so the children would speak, maybe they would say Allah instead of Allahu, and they would discipline their children for doing that. SubhanAllah. What do we discipline our children for, everyone? Ah, oh, spending too much time on the iPad. Oh, it's too much time on your phone. That is why. <laughs> that is why you have all these problems in your life. <laughs> yeah? Oh, I know that for sure. But SubhanAllah. You know, I'm just, uh, you know, uh, releasing my inner auntie, you know, <laughs> getting ready for the future. Anyway, let's continue on with the with the statement. Due to this, we are ordered, whether it be an obligation or even if it's just a recommendation, to preserve the Arabic grammatical rules and to correct the tongues that have deviated from correct speech. By doing so, we preserve the methodology of understanding the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And we also preserve the following of the Arabs in their manner of correct speech. Listen to this, everyone. If people were left to their grammatical mistakes, this would be considered a great deficiency and a despicable mistake. Can you just feel the intensity of that? It would be a despicable mistake, subhanAllah. So let's avoid doing this. 
let us spend some time to learn Arabic grammar so that we can literally preserve the methodology of understanding the Quran. Imagine when you take some time to learn Arabic grammar to however much level that you can and you understand the Quran properly, you are actually preserving this tr very sacred, this ancient tradition of the methodology of understanding the Quran. You know, from teacher to student, student to teacher. You know, it was, you know, people didn't learn Quran from YouTube and from Instagram and from, um, you know, Facebook groups and stuff. You know, this is all modern day stuff. The real method of teaching and learning is from teacher to student, right? And because it's only a teacher who can correct your mistakes. Isn't that right? And a teacher who corrects your mistakes with love and with humility, that's the best type of teacher. I know because I've had teachers like that and that is why I'm a teacher today, alhamdulillah. Okay, everyone, was that a motivational reminder from Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah? Are we motivated to teach ourselves Arabic and our children Arabic, inshallah? Go ahead and type in the chat box if you are motivated and to be part of the legacy of the methodology of understanding the Quran, inshallah. Okay, well, let's go into a bit of a funny, um, a bit of a lighthearted uh, session now. <laughs> so we have a scenario here, okay? We have a scenario here. As you can see, um, we have a sentence on the screen, and it goes, Zawwaja al-Imam Zaid Zainab. Hmm, very interesting. Who can guess the translation of this um, of this sentence? Go ahead and and take a take a wild guess. Um, you know, even if you don't know Arabic, you can see the pictures. Okay, there's a wedding ring here. There's an imam. There's a Zaid and there's a Zainab. By the way, any Zaids or Zainabs in the class? <laughs> okay, well. Let me just tell you this drama that is happening between Zayd and Zainab. It's very juicy and we're going to get right into it with the grammatical structure. Okay, you're going to learn something from this drama. So this is the thing. If you say Zawwaja al-Imam Zayd Zainab, then yeah, you can translate it as the Imam married off Zayd and Zainab together. Okay, but how about if we change the order around? And we say, <laughs> we say, Zawwaja Zaid al Imam Zainab. Now what, it, now, what does it mean? Go ahead and type in the chat box. What do you think it means now? Is it Zaid who's marrying Zainab or is it the Imam? So you see, there's this love triangle happening. You know, everyone wants to marry Zainab. Any Zainabs in the, in the room? Tell us your secret, sis. <laughs> Zawwaja Zainab, Zaid al-Imam, that, you know, we don't know who is marrying who because there's so many characters and there's not enough grammatical structure for us to actually understand who is marrying who. So, everybody, let me explain this to you in depth and this will make you really understand the importance of even one haraka. You see, Zawwaja al-Imamu, if you put a Dhamma, on the word imam, zawaja is a verb. So the person who does the verb has to have a dhamma on, on, on it. Okay. So the imam is doing the act of zawaja. He's marrying two people together, right? Which is what an imam does. And who is he marrying? Uh, meaning marrying off or conducting the nikah for? He is conducting it for Zaydan and Zainaba. So you see Zaydan and Zainab, they both have Fatha on the end of their names. And that indicates that they're the ones who are being married together. Okay. So this is a this is fine. This is a great sentence. Mashallah, congratulations to both Zayd and Zainab. You know, you didn't invite me to the wedding, but that's okay, you know. Um, I'll come, <laughs> you know, that's all right, inshallah. You can send me some cake later on. However, the plot twist is now, my dear brothers and sisters, if we change around the word Zaid and Imam and we go Zawwaja Zaidun, now Zaid has the Dhamma on him. So that means he's doing, 
he is doing the nikah for who? For the imam, al imama, and Zainaba. So, I mean, you can just understand the situation. Maybe, maybe you know, Zayd and Zainab, they just thought, you know, why well, it's not going to work out between us at the at the at the masjid. They're just like, you know, what? Well, it's not going to work out. Hey, you know, Zainab, my friend, the imam is single. Would you like to marry him? And Zainab's like, you know what? It's okay. As long as I get my mahar, I am fine. I'll marry whoever it is. <laughs> and so the imam was like, okay, you know, can't hurt. And so he marries Zainab, <laughs> mashallah. <laughs> and Zainab just like, girl, as long as I get my mahar, I don't care who I'm marrying. <laughs> Subhanallah. So you see, you see, my dear sisters and brothers, that one haraka can change your whole life. It can even change who you end up marrying. <laughs> so <clears throat> you see, you see. Um this is such an important topic you know you see learning the meaning the differences between the fatha dhamma and kasra the grammatical differences the states even the way that a, a sentence is structured it can change the whole meaning of the sentence it can even change your whole life at the same time if you knew the grammar then you would fully understand the eloquence and the flexibility of the arabic language you know there is a reason why arabic language was the one to be chosen for the last revelation it wasn't english in when you learn english compared to arabic you're just like whoa english is just like mid it's just like you know mid tier when you learn arabic it's like subhanallah you're just like wow this is the reason why allah chose arabic and my students in my in my course they always tell me this because the English translation can never do justice. So you see, my dear sisters and brothers, my dear students from around the world, if you want to build up your understanding of the Quran, you want to preserve the methodology of you understanding the Quran and passing it down to the next generation, we need these three things, and that is Quranic vocabulary, tafsir and translation, and Arabic grammar. <clears throat> and that is exactly what I teach you in the 12 week certified Quranic Arabic course, Keys to the Quran. You will be able to understand 70% of the Quran in just 12 weeks with everything, including this Arabic grammar, including the tafsir and explanation. And of course, you get awesome support from a teacher who is very passionate about Arabic language. P.S. That's me. <laughs> um, I want to ask you a question. Who here thinks that learning Arabic or who here thought, previously thought that learning Arabic grammar is difficult? But by coming to this course and by coming to this class, you realize that, hey, maybe I just need the right teacher <laughs> or maybe I just need the right methodology. Right. So, yes, it is tricky. But if you have a teacher who can explain things to you in the right way, then it will, inshallah, you'll learn it and you'll never forget it. Now, my dear brother, chat box, or you can just message me or email me before the weekend and you can just tell me that you're interested in the keys to the Quran program and I will personally send you the details. And just to make it even more easier for you, uh, those who enter into the keys to the Quran program, the 12 week course, it's a holistic course, you know, so we teach you grammar, Arabic, and also we teach you tafsir um, because you get a tafsir course. The 12 week tafsir course is included in the keys to the Quran package. And also you get a hadith course on the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah. Some people in this class have already done some of these courses and they can tell you about it. Um, in, in case you don't want to enroll in keys to the Quran, then you can enroll in these courses separately. And I can post the link for that in the chat box as well. Uh, I already have a couple of people signed up for the tafsir course, which is happening straight after Ramadan. You can actually use a $100 discount for this as well. So um, go ahead and check it out, inshallah. If you have any questions about any of my courses, then you're more than welcome to DM me or message me or email me. I'll get back to you as soon as I can, inshallah. Um, 
if you love these classes, I'm telling you, this 12-week tafsir class is going to blow your mind, inshallah, because I explained the last 10 surahs of the Qur'an with so much depth, so much, like, with psychology, with scientific uh, aspect, and from an Islamic pers uh, perspective as well, of course. So it's a very interesting tafsir course. Okay, everyone, let's get back into the lesson. So, who knows the meaning of Surah Al-Asr? So the word Al-Asr, I'm going to explain it to you in depth right now. So ha has anyone actually, listen, let me ask you first, Al-Asr, uh, so any questions about payments or timings, uh, inshallah, I will explain to you uh, through DMs or email, or I can explain it to you tomorrow, inshallah, okay? Or you can just message me and I'll tell you. Okay, so, wal asr, asr in Arabic, it means afternoon, or it means the declining day. Sort of like, you know, asr time, right? Everyone knows what asr time is. It's just before uh, sunset, when, the when, you know, the sun is setting, the sky is changing color. Uh, some people like to call it golden hour, you know? And why do we call it al-asr, everyone? Because it comes from the word a, sa, and ra, okay? A, sa, ra. And asara, it means to extract something. Extract. Have you ever heard of the word asir? What does asir mean? Anyone knows what asir means? Asir al laymun, asir al burtaqal. Yes, asir in Arabic means juice. Okay? So if you want to if you want to order juice you say oh, I want some asir. What do you think could be the correlation my dear students what what do you think could be the correlation between juice and time? <laughs> juice or extracting something and time. What is the what is the uh, connection between the two? Well, yes, we have some good uh, guesses in the chat box, I think. Anyone is guessing? Okay. Let me tell you, what is the correlation between juice and time? Well, you see, just as you extract the juice from a fruit, you extract it as much as possible. Similarly, with time, you need to extract as much benefit as you can. You have to squeeze the benefit you have to squeeze every single second out of that day with good deeds, with productive things, with good habits, so that you can get closer to your goal. Because just as the day ends, our life will eventually end as well, right? And we will regret the time that we spent not in the remembrance of Allah or doing things that are not beneficial, right? So that's why we want to squeeze and extract as much benefit as we can from the time that we have. And that's why it's called Al-Asr, subhanAllah, the declining day. The, yes, and they're both running out of time, 100%. Isn't that so beautiful? Yes. That is such an amazing um, correlation, right? But you see, uh, you wouldn't have known that if I didn't explain the root word of asara to you. The translation just says by time, right? So I hope that motivates you to learn a little bit more about Arabic language because there's so much beauty in every single word. Let's go into the into the next ayah. So it goes, Wal asr. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wal asr. Inna al insana lafi khusr. Okay? Now, it means indeed mankind is in loss. Now, this is a typical translation. It's a good translation. It's, it's found in many translations. However, I would actually improve on this translation as an as a Arabic grammar professional, I, I guess. There is a bit more translation or a bit more depth to the sentence that we can add. And I'm going to explain it to you in depth, and you're going to be like, whoa. So you see the word... What's the first word in this sentence? It's the word inna. And hey guys, didn't we learn the word inna on day two of the course? Go ahead and type in the chat box, what does inna mean? 
Yes, inna means indeed. So it's used for emphasis. Yeah. Al insana means mankind or humankind. Lafi khusr is in loss. So in this sentence, it looks like there's only one type of emphasis, but actually there are more types of emphasis over here because it goes in al insana lafi khusr. This lam also represents emphasis as well. So inna means indeed and la over here would mean surely. So you could add indeed mankind is surely in loss. So that gives a little bit more meaning, a little bit more depth. Okay. But let me ask you a question. You know how it says fi khusr, in loss? L let me ask you a question. What is the difference between saying I am a loser and saying I am in loss? Go ahead and type in the chat box. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that these people are going to be in loss? Not that they are losers, but they are in loss. Mm, okay, very good. So we have a couple of uh, interesting interpretations in the chat box. Let me go ahead and let me explain it to you. What is the difference between saying I am a loser? When you say I am a loser, it's actually an adjective. Okay, an adjective is a characteristic and characteristics they can change one day you're a loser and one day you're a winner one day you break even yeah you can always change your characteristics um everyone can be many different things you can be a winner and a loser at the same time right some things you're losing some things some things you're winning and that's the nature of life however when you say i am in loss it's as if you are in the location. It says it's a state of permanence. It's as if you are overwhelmed by loss, so much so that you are in it. If you could, if you could imagine how loss, the concept of loss looks like, maybe for me, I feel like it looks like a big, huge pit, like a deep, dark pit, just full of darkness. And mankind is just in that dark, dark pit you know, and just wallowing in that darkness. And it's like as if they can never come out. It's like a huge, huge, deep, deep, um, yeah, hole in the ground. It's as if you can't even get out. But, my dear sisters and brothers, alhamdulillah, did Allah tell us that we are going to be in loss forever? No. He gave us the solution. He gave us the stairway out of this deep, dark pit. And that is, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ Yeah, so, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسُرُ Indeed, mankind is surely in a great loss. Yes, it's a better translation, still not perfect. And he gave us the key to salvation, and that is these four things. Now, before I get into the meaning of this ayah, I want to ask you, have you ever heard of this phrase, happening in the Quran. So maybe you've heard of it recited recited like this. Alladina Amanu Amilu Salihat. Alladina Amanu Amilu Salihat. Yeah. Have you heard of this phrase being recited again and again? Maybe it sounds familiar. Okay, well it means those who have believed and done righteous deeds. Can you guess how many times this phrase occurs in the Quran? As you can see over here it occurs in many different surahs, uh, in different contexts, etc. So it actually occurs more than 50 times in the Quran, just this one phrase. You know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Jannah and telling them about the reward for those who believed and did righteous deeds, you know, so many beautiful descriptions of Jannah. So, you know, since it occurs 50 times in the Quran, don't you think it is a good idea for us to add this to our word list? Go ahead and type in the chat box if you want to add these words into our word list. Okay, let's go. So I want you to screenshot this slide or you can um, take a picture of it or you can write it down. So we have the word Alladina. Alladina means those who. And I don't have the exact number, but I do know that Alladina, it, it occurs 1,000 times in the Qur'an. Okay. Uh, amanu means believed. So it comes from the word Iman. 
Iman means belief. Amanu means believed. It's like the same root word. Um, wa in Arabic just means and. Okay, so very simple. Uh, amilu means they did, you know, so amal means to do something. And salihat means good deeds. Okay. So go ahead and write these down. Alladina amanu wa amilu salihat. Now, if you, I actually calculated it uh, afterwards. And I saw that including the root words and the singulars and everything else, this, this combination of words, they actually add up to 8% of Quranic words. Because the word amanu is used more than a thousand times in the Quran. And the word amilu is also used more than a thousand times. And of course, alladina also. Salihat and of course, wa, you know, and is used in every single sentence. It's uh, salihat, maybe not as much, but these three words, especially, they if you add them up all together, they occur, they make up around 8% of Quranic words, okay? And I'm sure that you'll be able to find the word alladina, you'll be able to find the word amanu, salihat, amilu, and wa in the Quran right now if I tell you to. So let's add that to our word list. And who can tell me how much percentage did we learn already in this course from our Quranic vocabulary word list? Yes? Who can tell me? So we actually learned 15% of Quranic words already. And we added on another 8% today with these words in our word list. So that means that we have, alhamdulillah, gotten to 23% of Quranic words. We have learned the word min, Allah, inna, fi, qala, alladina, amanu, and amilu, salihat. Including the root words, yeah? I'm sure, my dear sisters and brothers, that when you open up the Quran, you will be able to find these words. And you'll be like, hey, I actually learned this in Ukhti's Arabic course. Oh my God. So you'll be like, subhanallah. Go ahead and type in the chat box, subhanallah, if you are feeling like this gif that I found. <laughs> uh, by the way, in my Arabic courses, in all my courses, I always put graphics, I always put memes. It's something that I that I make try to make unique about my courses, you know? Well, everyone, we have learned 23%. Now, in this course, I promised you that we're going to learn all the way to 30%. So go ahead and type in the chat box, who is ready to learn all the way to 30% of Quranic words today, inshallah. Type in the chat box, yes, I am ready to learn. Are you ready? Okay, well, bring it on. Let's do this, everyone. Inshallah, let's do this. Okay, get your pen and paper ready because you said yes, you're ready, but I want to ask you, what is this word? Does anyone know what this word is? You're saying la. Hey, you guys just said yes. Now why are you saying no? <laughs> okay, that was a cringy joke. Anyway, la means no, okay? It means no, not never. It's used for negation, and it actually occurs 2,323 times in the Qur'an. And it makes up 3% of Qur'anic words, okay? 3%, subhanAllah. So it's a very high number. So you see, my dear sisters and brothers, we have our brother, um, you know, let's just say that he converted to Islam. Instead of Drake, we now call him uh, Dawood. <laughs> We now call him Dawood. So, Brother Dawood over here, okay? He's saying, waste time in Ramadan? La, la. But learn Arabic with Ukhti. Uh, what's the opposite of la? The opposite of la is na'am. Go ahead and type in the chat box, na'am, if you are ready to learn Arabic with Ukhti. <laughs> and maybe even Brother Dawood will join us. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> okay, well. What is the key statement to entering into Islam? So all jokes aside, what do we all as Muslims believe in? If someone wants to enter into Islam, what do they need to say? What is the key to Islam? Yes, it is none other than the Shahada. La ilaha illallah, right? La ilaha illallah. 
So let's go ahead and let's add these words to our, our word list as well because we already know that the word la it means no or not or never and it occurs three percent of the time in the quran the word ilah means god or deity okay is very similar to to the word allah but allah is the proper name ilah is the noun and illa don't get confused illa means accept and it occurs 664 times in the Quran. So when we say la ilaha illa, it means there is no God except. And then of course, the answer is there is no God except Allah. So we won't add the last word, but if we just add la ilaha illa, then that's already 4% of Quranic words over the other. Because this is 3%, we add this, it makes 4%. Okay, so you know 27% now. Who is ready for the last 3%, inshallah? Who is ready for the last 3%? We are nearly there. We have almost reached our goal. And I'm going to, and this last section is going to be very beautiful because it is something that we say all the time in our lives. When we say, when do we say this phrase in our lives? Alhamdulillah. When do we say it? Go ahead and type in the chat box. When was the last time you said Alhamdulillah? Maybe you said it today. Maybe you said it yesterday. Maybe you said it right now. <laughs> so yes, you are grateful. When you sneeze, yes, that's right. When you sneeze, uh, you, your heart actually stops for a millisecond when you sneeze. And so when you your heart starts back up again, you should be saying Alhamdulillah because Allah literally gives you life after you sneeze um, in your prayers. Yes. And what is the number one surah in the Quran which starts with this phrase? Alhamdulillah. Who can tell me which surah is it that starts with this phrase? Alhamdulillah. Yes, it is none other than Surah Fatiha, which goes Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Yeah. So let's break it down. So the word alhamdu, oh, okay, wait, over here. The word alhamdu, it, it means praise, all praise. Actually, I'll write it for you. All praise. And the word lillahi, it means for Allah. Now, before we get into the rest of this, I want to just deconstruct the word lillahi. So, you know how over here it looks like lillahi? It looks like one word, right? But actually, lillahi is actually two words joined together. It's the word li, which, is, which means for. And that uh, li, meaning for, it occurs 1,407 times in the Quran. So it makes up around 2% of Quranic words. It's a preposition. It's used all the time. Lillahi wa li rasulihi, li sabilihi, like li, li and la, lahu, lakum, laha. It's all used. It's a preposition. It means for. And then we know that Allah means Allah. So when you add li and Allah together, it becomes lillahi, which means for Allah. Or, you know, for the sake of Allah kind of thing, right? So... If we add that together, then it becomes Alhamdulillahi, the word Rabb. Rabb means Lord. Now, I can go into a very, very in-depth explanation of the word Rabb, which I do in my 12-week tafsir course. But we don't have time for that now because the word Rabb, it doesn't just mean Lord. It means sustainer, nourisher, caretaker, provider, um, overseer, uh, and so and loving nurturer subhanallah so i can go into a more instant explanation but inshallah maybe another time and we learned the word alameen if you remember from day two of the course can anyone remember what alameen means alam you know we learned about the difference between alam and alim well alam means worlds or universes and alameen means worlds it's the plural okay so excluding the words that we've already learned before, the word alhamdulillah, the statement alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, including the, the word li, including the word rab, etc. 
it makes up around 3% of Quranic words because these words occur all the time, including the root words and the singulars. And that is it, everyone. Alhamdulillah, we are done. We have officially learnt 30% of Quranic words in the Quran in just four days of this five-day Quranic Arabic course. Alhamdulillah. Go ahead and type in the chat box, Alhamdulillah, if you are so excited and so grateful to have come to this course to learn 30% of Quranic words. And I do recommend, my dear sisters and brothers, that you practice this. The way to practice what we have learned today is to read the Quran and find these words and, and, and actually practice uh, translating these words yourself, inshallah, until you get the hang of it, until you learn the grammar and you can understand it completely. So you see, you know, every single word that we learned, min Allah, inna fi qala, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, alladheena amanu wa amilu salihat. You see, these are just, these look like just words, but actually every single word is like a golden coin, okay? It's like gold and silver. Because what did the Prophet ﷺ say? He said, Verily, the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. They do not leave behind gold or silver coins, but rather they leave behind knowledge. Whoever has taken hold of it has been given an abundant share. So how can you take hold of it? How can you be given an abundant share? By gaining more knowledge gaining more of the inheritance of the prophets because that is the inheritance that you can take with you to the next life as well you know you can spend so much time gaining gold coins silver coins money wealth houses cars gucci bags louis vuittons yeah but can you take it to the world can you take it to the next world my dear sisters and brothers no we can't the only wealth that we can take to the next world is our knowledge so may Allah give us an abundant share, an abundant share of the inheritance of the Prophet. Ameen. Everybody say Ameen in the chat box, inshallah. Okay. <clears throat> so you see, everyone, that is the methodology. We have the Quranic vocabulary, the tafsir and translation, and the Arabic grammar. In day two, we learned the gems from Quranic vocabulary. In day three, we learned the pearls from the tafsir. And in day four, we learned the gold from Arabic grammar. And you see, my dear sisters and brothers, the knowledge that we have learned here today, it is even more precious than these substances, than these gems and pearls and gold. Isn't it? Go ahead and type in the chat box if you agree that the knowledge that you have learned and the knowledge that you will learn will is even more precious than these worldly assets. Now, I want to ask you a question. Okay, let's be a little bit serious now. Did you enjoy and benefit from this course? I would really, really like to know. <clears throat> so did you enjoy and benefit from this course? So we have people in the chat box saying yes, alhamdulillah. Okay, let me ask you another question. Do you believe in Good Tree Arabic Academy's mission? My mission is to teach 1,000 Muslims around the world Quranic, Arabic, and Islam. That is my mission, my dear sisters and brothers. You know, I've been doing Good Tree Arabic Academy for the past nearly three years now. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, I, I'm glad to say that... Um, What's it called? I have reached maybe 10% of my of my goal, you know. I still have a long way to go. This is my lifelong mission, you know. Do you think that other people might benefit from this free five-day Arabic course also to learn Arabic and Quran, to motivate them, to give them the motivation, to give them the structure? Okay, well, today's homework is very simple, okay? Let's get right into it. And it's very important and precious for me. Just like gold and silver is precious for other people, the homework that you're going to be doing today is very precious for me. Well, today's homework is very simple, and that is that 
I would like you to write a review, okay? And the review, I'd like you to do it in this way. I'd like you to say, I did the five-day Quranic Arabic course with Tasneem Alam or with Ukhti, and I learned so many things, including I enjoyed or I loved it, and I'm looking forward to, and I'd like you to put your name and country at the end, okay? So you can definitely put your review underneath the homework post. Inshallah, I'll be giving you shout outs. I'll be replying to them. Or you can email me at goodtreearabic at gmail.com. I highly, highly recommend that you just post it underneath. If you're on Instagram or Facebook, that you write your review underneath the post. Okay, so other people can see it as well. Um, or if you don't have any social media, that's totally fine. You can just email me at goodtreearabic at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, I would also love it if you could post your review on our uh, Facebook page, inshallah, because, you know, people, they want to know if it's a legitimate thing or not. You know, alhamdulillah, I'm 100% real and 100% halal, okay, <laughs> inshallah. So uh, I would love for you to do that. Otherwise, if you can't do it, that's fine. If you can follow us on social media channels, that would be good. And tomorrow is going to be super exciting, okay? Tomorrow is the last day, and it is my favorite day, okay? Um, first of all, we will be having a mini quiz about the past four days, so it's going to be really good revision for you. Go ahead and type in the chat box if you are excited to do the mini quiz, inshallah. And this is going to give you a really good um, overview of the past four days. Inshallah, I will be inviting you on the enlightened path to learning Arabic and seeking knowledge. I'm going to be telling you some amazing stories that will motivate you to the end of time. We're going to be talking about the enlightened path to seeking knowledge, the invitation on the journey of Arabic language, and we'll be giving scholarship discounts. And of course, we'll be doing the giveaway because as you know, I'll be gifting three students this beautiful Quran and I'll be announcing the winners at the end of tomorrow's lesson. And of course, remember how I promised you that everybody will get a gift? Well, who wants the 10 Quranic words a day challenge vocab list? You know, you have already learned 30% of it. You all, you just need to do another 40% inshallah. And you will understand 70% of the Quran, the Quranic vocab that is, okay? You need to learn the grammar as well, as we have learned today. Otherwise, you know, you can't translate it 100%. But it's a very, very good start. And I'm going to give you this PDF. You can print it out. You can share it with your friends and family. You and your children, you and your spouse, you and your siblings, you can learn one word a day or three words a day. And inshallah. It will be very beneficial for you. So if you stay until the end of tomorrow, you will receive this gift for me. And inshallah, please do stay until the end because we will be making a special dua. You know, we've come to this five-day course and we've done so many amazing things. We've learned so many amazing things about the Quran, about Islam. I think, you know, we have been in the meadows of paradise and the angels are surrounding us. I think in this blessed month of Ramadan, my dear sisters and brothers, isn't it a good time for us to make a special dua? Go ahead and type in the chat box if you will attend this special dua that we will be doing at the end of the class. Because we need you to say ameen. Because we don't know whose dua will be accepted by Allah Ta'ala. So we have so many people in the Zoom room. Inshallah, we will be doing a beautiful emotional dua at the end of the class to end our class and end our course. So inshallah, that is it from me today. I will see you all tomorrow. Jazakumullah khair. I'm looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow and to seeing you in some of our courses, inshallah. And to seeing your reviews. That is the main thing. So if you have any questions, you can always let me know. So take care. Jazakumullah khair. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.